remember Cinderella? The, the pumpkin that turns into a coach and the mice that become horses? Dude, could you be more gay? Don't answer that. Hey, I'm Jack. I use they them pronouns. I'd like to talk about homophobia and gay representation in Supernatural for a bit. I started watching Supernatural during season four when I was in high school, while I was already in a state of obsession with biblical mythology, demonology, the hierarchies of angels, all that stuff, to the point that I was making fan art for the Ars Goetia. Then I saw Castiel's intro, and I don't think I ever really recovered. I watched the show live until mid-season nine, when I saw the director's commentary for a single scene in the previous season, and it pissed me off so much that I stopped watching the show for six years. I'll get more into that later. I didn't pick it back up until November 5th, 2020, when certain events occurred. You changed me, Dean. I love you. Don't do this, Cass. I completed a full rewatch, during which I noticed a lot of things that I missed the first time through, especially in regards to representation. So I decided to make a video essay about it, despite never having done that before, or even really knowing how, uh, because there's something wrong with me, I think. I like a lot of things about the show, but honestly, I wouldn't suggest that anyone else watch it. One, because it's 15 seasons long, which is too many of those. And two, because it is, particularly in its early seasons, bigoted in a way that modern TV usually isn't. Supernatural is often, and rightly, criticized for the way it treats its female characters and its characters of color. But I'm particularly interested in discussing how gay characters and gay sexuality are presented on the show. Discussions on that subject in Supernatural tend to center around the idea of queerbaiting, and that's understandable, but it's not what I want to talk about. What I'd like to do is look at the way the show depicts gay characters on the whole. I'm going to be using gay as an umbrella term, so to be clear, when I say gay in this video, I mean characters that are shown to have any level of romantic and or sexual attraction to people of the same gender, including bi or pan characters. If I'm talking about a man who is exclusively attracted to men, I will specify that. And I'm using the word gay rather than a broader term, like LGBTQ+, because this video isn't about non cisset experiences in general, but rather focusing on the representation of sexual orientation. Before we really get into it, in case there are people watching who aren't familiar with Supernatural, I will attempt to give a very condensed plot summary of the show. I'll definitely be skipping a lot of things that would be very important in terms of a full plot summary, but they aren't really relevant for this video, so I'll be leaving them out. Uh, it's already long enough. I just want to explain the basic premise, some in-universe terminology, and any information that will be relevant later so that people can follow along. Major spoilers for the entire show, if that wasn't obvious. Two brothers, Sam and Dean Winchester, travel the country hunting supernatural creatures. Their mom was killed by a demon when they were kids, and their father, John, took them on the road to track it down and get revenge. In the process of hunting this demon, he learns of other types of monsters as well, including things like ghosts, werewolves, vampires, and witches, among other things. It has a monster of the week formula, but it starts to incorporate more overarching plot lines as the series goes on. There is actually a whole underground community of monster hunters who are just referred to as hunters. Sam and Dean sometimes interact with them, but they mostly work alone. You're going to see a few clips of Sam and Dean in suits and using FBI badges. They aren't actually FBI agents, they're impersonating officers to get information. And they actually get arrested for that several times in the earlier seasons, uh, and also for their many murders, since monsters in this show tend to just look like regular people. Sam and Dean always manage to escape, but they are wanted as serial killers until they're able to fake their own deaths. The most prominent hunter in their lives is Bobby, who is their adoptive father figure, since John Winchester wasn't exactly father of the year material. John dies in season two, and the revenge quest against the demon that killed their mother ends in the season two finale. The show then started to more strongly incorporate biblical mythology. Dean sold his soul to a demon to save Sam's life, and was given a year to live. Season three is spent trying to find a way to get out of this deal, but they fail, and Dean is killed and dragged to hell. The biblical aspect escalated in season four, which is where angels are introduced, as they rescue Dean from hell in order to recruit him to fight on their side against the apocalypse. Castiel is the first angel who appears on screen and becomes the most prominent recurring character in the entire show. He's the one who actually pulled Dean out of hell. There are several points where he and the Winchesters are at cross purposes, but after a rocky start to their relationship, he becomes their closest friend and ally. The way angels work on this show is a little unusual. 
They have to possess human bodies to walk the earth, just like demons do, except they need the host's explicit permission. In Castiel's case, the man he's possessing is actually killed while Cass is possessing him. His body is restored and Cass still possesses it, but the host's soul had moved on to heaven, so conveniently it's just Cass in there for the rest of the show. I wanted to mention that since I'll be talking about Cass's sexuality later, and I wanted to make it clear that there's not, like, a consent issue in a isn't there someone you forgot to ask kind of way. One pretty unique thing about this show I should mention is that it gets very, very meta. There is an in-universe book series that chronicles the events of the first five seasons that was written by a supposed prophet. This prophet had visions of Sam and Dean's lives without realizing they were real, and turned them into pulpy, canonically low-quality horror novels that gained a small but devoted fanbase. This allows the show to directly address things like shipping, fanfiction, cosplaying, and stuff like that in the show. It first comes up in season 4 and shows up intermittently throughout the entire series, but not super often. Trying to avert the apocalypse is the main focus of the 4th and 5th seasons. There's a lot of stuff to explain why Sam and Dean, despite being just some guys, are heavily involved in that, but I can't figure out a short way to explain it, and it's not really important for the purposes of this video, so don't worry about it. These Carhartt models are super cosmically important, I promise. It turns out that the higher-up angels, who at first pretended to be trying to stop the apocalypse, actually want it to happen just as much as the demons do. They just think their side is going to win. Unfortunately, it's a no-matter-who-wins-we-lose kind of situation where if the apocalypse happens, humanity will be wiped out. Also, this is where it's revealed that God is no longer in heaven and has been missing for a long time. After they discover this, Cass turns his back on the other angels to help humanity, but it is too late to stop Lucifer from being freed. In the season 5 finale, Sam allows Lucifer to possess him in order to throw both Lucifer and himself into hell, and ends up bringing the Archangel Michael and his own half-brother Adam down with him, don't worry about that. This is where the show was originally planned to end, but when it was unexpectedly renewed, it was changed that Sam was rescued from hell, and the series continued. So that's the end of the world dealt with. Then they threw spaghetti at the walls for 10 years to see what stuck, and there's not really a quick way to summarize it, so I'm just not going to try. All you really need to know is they still fought monsters, there were more potentially world-ending threats, and in the last seasons, God himself was the main antagonist. Yeah, God looks like this in Supernatural, don't worry about it. In the end, God is actually depowered and made human, and replaced by this character, whose existence you do not need to hear me try to explain. He's three years old and he's God now. It's fine. <laughs> and the show ends by following both Sam and Dean to their deaths and into heaven, which is the worst possible answer to where should your story end, but whatever, fine. One last note before we get started. Dean's sexuality is the subject of some debate. Personally, I do prefer to interpret him as bi, and I think there are some scenes in the show that would make more sense, or just be better if he was, but those scenes almost certainly were not meant to be taken that way. There are some that were clearly just gay jokes, and some were the result of unclear writing, or they were deliberately made to have enough ambiguity to allow the creators to deny any gay interpretations. Which they do deny, uh, vehemently and often. Because of that, I feel like including Dean would be giving the makers of the show way more credit than they deserve for something they explicitly and repeatedly refused to do. So I won't be discussing Dean as a canonically gay character. With that out of the way, let's talk about the gay representation on Supernatural. I don't think this show is hugely more homophobic than other shows that aired around the same time, but I do think it has some unique elements that are worth discussing. Gay sexuality is demonized in a very literal way in Supernatural, often being directly associated with monstrousness. That probably sounds like a pretty extreme claim, but bear with me, I will be presenting evidence. In the cases where gay sexuality is not demonized, it's often treated as a joke or as tragic. There are some exceptions, and one defense I often see against people accusing the show of homophobia is, if they were homophobic, why would they include Charlie, a fan-favorite recurring lesbian character? And like, okay, Charlie's great, but she's also one character in a 15-season show, and despite having some great moments, she did still get stabbed to death and dumped in a bathtub. There are other notable exceptions that I will bring up, but the gay representation on the show that I would describe as neutral or positive still has elements that I think reveal a reluctance to show affection between people of the same gender. So my main claims are these. 1. Gay sexuality is demonized. 
Two, gay sexuality is used as the butt of the joke. And three, gay characters' stories very often end in tragedy. To prove those claims, I'm going to go through and analyze every instance I could find of characters who are explicitly attracted to people of the same gender and instances of sexual assault between characters of the same gender in all 15 seasons of Supernatural. Now, I am including sexual assault, but that isn't necessarily an expression of sexual orientation. I'm including those examples because it illustrates how the show chose to present sex and sexuality between people of the same gender, whether or not the character committing the assault is actually gay. Here's how we're going to do this. I will present a brief summary of every character included by the previously stated criteria. I will split those characters up by category, analyze them individually, and talk about the patterns present in each category. Then I'll go through some final thoughts and conclusions. Okay, let's do a quick bullet point overview of all of these characters. For recurring characters, I'll be mentioning the first episode where they either are explicitly confirmed as gay or they assault someone of the same gender, and then mention any moments after that that I think are particularly significant. I will also keep track of which characters die. It might get a little hard to follow, so I made these little icons to help. I think they turned out pretty cute. All right, here we go. Okay, we've got a vampire assaulting a woman and infecting her with her blood. Great start, guys. A woman with psychic powers is a line about how she accidentally killed her girlfriend and then has killed herself. One female demon flirts with another female demon to distract her before they fight. One is killed. The other is a recurring character who is killed a season later. A guy has an unrequited crush on a straight man and his attraction is treated as a joke. He is killed and then his attraction continues to be treated as a joke. Dean gets tricked into asking for a pro-dom by someone he tried to pressure for information. These cosplayers are partners and they are treated as a joke by the narrative and by Sam and Dean. A demon steals a man's soul with a kiss. A demon steals a man's soul with a kiss. That demon, Crowley, is a prominent recurring character. He becomes a reluctant ally and sacrifices himself in a later season. Two guys in a goth bar kiss and Sam and Dean react like this. This woman has a crush on her married friend and is decapitated by her witch husband. This human serial killer is in love with the demon that Sam and Dean exercised from him years ago. They have an awkward little dance and then are killed and exercised respectively. Lucifer on several occasions heavily implies that he raped Sam while Sam was in hell, and in one episode outright states it. He gets killed or locked away and comes back like a billion times over the course of the show, but he does end up permitted in the second to last episode, finally. Charlie's here, thank God. She has a couple lines about being a lesbian in her first episode, but no on-screen relationships with women yet. She comes back a season later, flirts with a girl, and makes out with Gilda, an actual fairy. First kiss between people of the same gender on Supernatural that is both consensual and not treated like a gag, and it only took eight seasons to get here. But don't worry, we will not get another one. <laughs> Charlie's next appearance, she dies but is immediately resurrected. This episode also features Dorothy, as in that Dorothy, and Charlie decides to join her in Oz. Charlie's back from Oz, she's been split into good and bad parts, and the bad part is the one that hits on women, while the good part explicitly does not. She has to reincorporate both halves in order to be whole again, fine. She works with Sam and Dean for a few episodes before getting tracked down by one of their enemies and killed. This guy flirts with Dean in a bar, two men are shot by Cupid. In the fanfiction episode, these two teenagers are in a relationship and they also portray Dean and Cass in a play, but I'm sure that doesn't mean anything. This woman uses she pronouns to refer to her first kiss. She gets her soul eaten, kills her grandma, and is killed. This woman says I love you to her off-screen wife. These two hunters are married and are retiring together. God mentions offhand that he's had boyfriends. This witch, Max Baines, has a joke line about seducing men. He comes back in a later episode where he mentions going on a date with a bartender. He survives the episode, but he condemns his soul to hell in order to resurrect his sister. He is not seen or mentioned again. This character shows up. She is not Charlie, but rather an alternate universe version of her who has very little in common with her except being a lesbian played by Felicia Day. These two characters, Claire and Kaya, have a cute flirtation that seems like it might develop into a relationship, and Kaya's dead. She does come back two seasons later in the most perfunctory way possible. This character's blood-stained pride t-shirt is used to frame someone for murder. She is later found alive, so at least there's that. Narfi, son of Loki, gets a shoulder rub from a male adult film actor. Sure, I'll put that in here. He is later killed. These two Two kids flirt and steal the Winchester's car and hold hands. A monster seduces a man and paralyzes him with a kiss before torturing and killing him. We're back to that, huh? He tortures a man before paralyzing him with a kiss and killing him. Cool. He paralyzes cats with a kiss. He is then decapitated. A character overhears a guy breaking up with his boyfriend. Gay rights, I guess. This guy is the victim of a literal hate crime. Just a regular human hate crime. We only know he's gay because of the investigation into his death. This character, Stevie, is in a relationship with alternate universe Charlie now. Okay, they seem pretty cute. 
They get disintegrated by God, along with every other person on the planet, to be fair. There is later an off-screen resurrection of everyone this happened to, but they're not seen or even mentioned again after this. And finally, we have Cass's declaration of love for Dean, which is both unanswered and immediately followed by death. We only know that Cass isn't still dead because of the line, literally two words long, quote, Cass helped, unquote, when Bobby is telling Dean about how heaven has been rebuilt by the new god. And that's it. That I could find, anyway. All right, now let's take a closer look. First, let's look at demonized characters. This female demon and Narfi are very minor cases, so I won't go into them individually. A vampire, Kate, after getting it on with her male partner, turns a woman through a bloody kiss. Now, do I think they meant to make an allusion to AIDS on purpose? No, of course not. But the fact that the first instance of a same-gender kiss in this show involves essentially a disease transferred by blood is... I don't know if funny is the right word, but you either laugh or you know the rest. Also, it's presented as something the female vampire does for the enjoyment of her male partner, which is a huge stereotype that bi women have to put up with. It's just really bad all around. This character also later sexually assaults Dean, falling further into the depraved bisexual trope. The rest of her vampire clan, except for the woman she turned, is killed. She and this woman flee, and she is not seen on the show again. So, the very first instance of same-gender sexuality on the show is a character who is shown to sexually assault people of various genders, and who is a non-human monster. This other female demon, Ruby, I don't have much to say about. She only alludes to being gay once, and it was a ploy to distract someone she was fighting, so I don't think it really means anything about her actual sexuality. She is in a relationship with Sam, where she gets him addicted to drinking demon blood and manipulates him into helping to release Lucifer from hell. Uh, she is then killed by Dean. Then we have the most literal example of demonization I can really think of, which is Crowley, a demon, stealing men's souls through the act of kissing them. This is how demon deals have worked in past episodes with female crossroads demons, where to steal someone's soul, the victim has to sign it over and seal the deal with a kiss. But this is the first time we've seen it with a male demon and a male victim. With the female crossroads demons, the kisses are presented as a form of temptation in themselves, with the demons possessing people who they know their victims will be attracted to. But for Crowley, it's clearly something he does for himself, enjoying the discomfort of his victims, who are all presented as straight men. First we get this homophobic banker, who Crowley needles for a bit, and the joke is at this guy's expense for being a homophobe. She said the deal would be sealed with a kiss. That's right. No, I mean, she's... Your I choice. Don't... You can cling to six decades of deep-seated homophobia, or just give it up and get a complete bailout of your bank's ridiculous incompetence. The banker agrees, but then actually says no right before Crowley kisses him and seems to try to pull away during the kiss. There's a horror sting in the music, and it's just... It's the first kiss between men we see on the show, and it's this. Later on, he takes Bobby's soul. Crowley shows a picture of the kiss when Bobby denies it happening. More gay jokes. These are the only two instances where Crowley kisses a man. We never see him have any consensual relationships with men, which makes sense, he's a demon. But we do have one instance where he is implied to have sex with another demon who is possessing a woman's body, and one instance where he's implied to have tortured and sexually assaulted a woman and two men while himself possessing a woman's body. He makes many references to gay sexuality, but only in a predatory way, including one truly disgusting comment where he alludes to the abuse of boys in the Catholic Church while posing as a priest. Do you know each other? Oh yes. Dean was a rather scrumptious young altar boy. There is also a bit in season 10 where Dean has become a demon due to circumstances, and him and Crowley are working together, and their relationship is clearly supposed to have a one-sided romantic or sexual interest on Crowley's part. Dean leaving Crowley and getting cured of demonicness is treated as a breakup. He's a prominent recurring character for quite a while. In fact, after Sam, Dean, and Cass, he is the next most prominent character in terms of number of episodes. And he moves from being someone they're forced to work with to being a complete enemy to being a reluctant ally and back and forth. And he just generally sticks around doing his own thing. They do kind of try to make him one of the team in later seasons, which I never really bought. Like, I actually like Crowley for the most part, especially in the earlier seasons. I think there were a lot of tone issues with his portrayal where it switched between cartoonish villainy and more realistic or serious evil actions, 
but I think he is, for the most part, an enjoyable character as a villain. But they went out of their way to make this guy as over-the-top despicable as they could. I just don't buy him being redeemed, and I really don't buy him being self-sacrificing, which is what ends up happening. He works more closely with the Winchesters and ends up sacrificing his own life in circumstances I don't really feel like explaining, but he's doing it to save the Earth. Crowley is also much more overtly sexual than any other gay character on the show, definitely much more so than any neutral or positive gay character. In another example of very, very overt demonization, we have the devil. <laughs> Lucifer as a character on this show gets pretty complicated and not in a good or interesting way, in my opinion. And I don't think it would help to really try to dissect or explain his character. Uh, he's the devil. You get it. This show had a hard time deciding whether it wanted him to be fun comic relief or pure terrifying evil, and in the end, they didn't really get either. What they did do consistently is make him very sexually threatening to various characters, but most overtly to Sam. There's a complicated relationship between Sam and Lucifer, but again, I don't think it would add to this video to get too far into that. I will just say that they are connected to each other in many ways. If you've seen the show, I hope you understand why I don't want to spend time trying to explain true vessels and demon blood and all that. The video is long enough already. When Sam allows himself to be possessed in order to return Lucifer to hell, he throws both of them into the cage, capital T, capital C, which is a place in hell designed to contain Lucifer. He is trapped in a cage with the literal devil, who has a personal grudge against him, no one else to take his frustration out on, and nothing but time. Time in hell passes differently than on Earth. By the time Sam is rescued, he was in hell for hundreds of years of nothing but torture. There is a wall put in place to block his memories in order to keep him functional. But, due to circumstances, Castiel, while high on ingested souls and mad with power, don't worry about it, breaks the wall in Sam's mind to incapacitate him. This gives him his memories back and also makes him start to hallucinate Lucifer. During these hallucinations, Lucifer on many occasions mocks Sam by heavily implying that he raped him, and by heavily implying, I mean he says he misses raping him. That's what I'm talking about, Sam. Real interaction again, I miss that. The rapier wit, the wittier rape. There are a few other really awful lines about being bunk buddies, about Sam being his bitch, quote, in every sense of the word, unquote. It's really bad, and it's never actually addressed at all. Just Lucifer taunting him in a somewhat vague way, but not that fucking vague, and Sam trying to ignore it. Sam eventually is able to permanently get rid of these hallucinations when a contrite Castiel, no longer high on souls, takes them into his own mind. But the real Lucifer does turn back up in later seasons and makes similar comments. He sexually assaults one other person as well, sleeping with her under false pretenses when he possesses the person she was seeing but Sam does appear to be his main target. The fact that this is only addressed in lines that are meant to mock Sam for being raped is something that's always bothered me, and not just for the obvious reason that that's an awful thing to do, but more so because there isn't any counterpoint to the joking where his assault is taken seriously. Like, if we are to look at this in a realistic way, it makes sense that sexual assault was part of the torture that Lucifer put Sam through. The idea that Lucifer would consider that a step too far is kind of absurd. But we don't have to look at it in a realistic way. Dean also went to hell for a long-ass time. Four months on Earth, but 40 years in terms of how we experienced it. And while he is deeply affected by it, it is never implied that the torture was sexual, at least not in the extremely direct way that it is with Sam. Again, I think if we're looking at it realistically, the idea that demons wouldn't use sexual assault as a form of torture in hell doesn't really make any sense. But this is a TV show, and extremely heavy topics like rape and sexual assault don't have to be brought up. And in Dean's case, they chose not to. But with Sam, they do bring it up. They chose to take it there. I don't think rape is a topic that should be completely shunned in fiction. It happens in real life, and it's possible to include rape and sexual assault in a story in a way that both makes sense and isn't disrespectful to survivors. Even having Lucifer mock him for it isn't inherently bad from a storytelling perspective. He wants to hurt Sam as much as possible, and this is a way to do that. But if you choose to include rape in your story, if you take it there, you have to deal with the consequences from that, or it's going to come across as flippant or disrespectful. Which this does. And that's just looking at this in isolation. 
Looking at it in the context of the show as a whole, it becomes even worse. Because this is one of only two instances that two male characters are implied to have had sex, the other one being Crowley's assault. Both instances are rape, and one of them is literally the devil. I know people are probably going to interpret that as me saying it's bad there wasn't more gay sex in Supernatural, but that's not really the point. The point is clearly they could include references to gay sexuality in the show, and they chose to only use that in reference to rape, and they chose to make the only instances of gay sex in their show involve, in one case, a demon, and in the other, the devil. Then we have Jeffrey, a human serial killer, and the demon that once possessed him. He explicitly says that he is in love with the demon that was exercised from him. Love of my life, actually. And kills people and dogs in order to get him back, summoning him with a spell he got from a witch whose son he kidnapped and tortured. Instead of possessing Jeffrey, this unnamed demon possesses the witch's son. They have an awkward little waltz while Jeffrey's demon makes sexually threatening comments towards him. We don't do no. Remember Jeffrey. Then Sam and the witch show up to rescue Dean, who had been captured. Jeffrey is shot, and the demon is exorcised. Once again, gay sexuality is associated with assault, evil, and monstrousness, whether that be the monstrousness of the demons or of Jeffrey's killings. Next, this one is a little weird. God mentions offhand that he's had both girlfriends and boyfriends. This is God, aka Chuck Shirley. <laughs> That's not gonna make any sense. I don't know how to make this make sense. It doesn't make sense in the show either, okay? So this is not my fault. Just don't fucking worry about it. He posed as a prophet for a while, or some people theorize that he actually possessed the real Chuck. In any case, he's actually the one who wrote the supernatural novels, and is canonically kind of a pathetic weirdo. The way they represent God on this show is really bizarre. It's also funny to me that they only mention that gods had boyfriends when they're setting him up to be an antagonist. I don't really know what to say about that. It's just one sort of jokey line, and it's never commented on any further than that, but he is an antagonist, and he is bi, so that's why he's here. Finally, we have Noah, the Gorgon, and his first on-screen victim, a trucker. Noah follows the trucker and says he really needs a ride. When he is initially refused, he subtly offers sex. The trucker agrees and lets Noah in the cab where he expects him to perform sexual favors. Noah kisses him briefly, and the trucker is annoyed, pressuring him for more, before the poison from the kiss kicks in and he is paralyzed. Noah then tortures and kills him. So, this trucker tried to coerce sex from a man in a vulnerable situation. He's human, but he's still a scumbag, so that's why he's in the demonization category. As for Noah himself, he also falls into the depraved bisexual trope, explicitly saying that he used to go after women. <laughs> no, I do eat ladies, too. But women have become so cautious lately. Must be all that finally waking up from centuries of misogynistic oppression. Good for them. What an ally. His other victims in this episode are this unnamed man and Castiel. After he paralyzes Castiel, he is killed. Okay, that's it for demonized characters. So, why is this a problem? It's not just that these gay characters are antagonists. It's that their sexuality is often associated directly with monstrousness with disease, with rape, with pedophilia, with demonicness. All of this plays into some of the oldest and most harmful gay panic stereotypes there are. Their sexuality is a part of their villainy, not something incidental to the character. These characters sexually assault people, their kisses are a vector for monstrousness or disease, they are sexually threatening, and they make references to pedophilia. Also, gay characters who actually express sexual attraction don't show up much in this show, and all but one of them are in this category. There is one scene where Charlie is making out with a woman and gets mad about being interrupted, and she has a couple lines in her first episode talking about hooking up with women, but those are, genuinely, the only examples in the entire show of a positively portrayed gay character expressing any kind of sexual desire. Contrast this with how the show portrays straight sexual attraction. This show isn't shy about showing sex and romance. Our protagonists have quite a few sex scenes and suggestive moments, but side characters get in on the action too. Even outside of Sam and Dean, there are a lot of sex scenes. There are a lot of times where it's implied that a character just had or is about to have sex. There are characters who share a bed, but only if they're a man and a woman. No same-gender couple gets any of that on this show. And it's not just because the show had no same-gender couples at all. It actually had several, but those couples are treated in a noticeably different way to straight couples. I mean, 
It's not that I expected to see on-screen gay sex in Supernatural, but I do think the sort of shocked and affronted reaction to even the idea of it that a lot of people seem to have does reveal a double standard considering the number of on-screen straight sex scenes this show has. The closest thing in the show to implied gay sex is when a male demon, while possessing a woman, sexually assaults and murders her husband and neighbors. The only references to gay male sexuality that I could find were made by both that same demon and also by Lucifer repeatedly joking about how he tortured and raped Sam. And when it comes to same-gender kisses, the vast majority of them are depicted as the predatory act of a literal monster. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that I personally would really love to see a bunch of explicit gay sex and makeout scenes in Supernatural. I don't really enjoy the straight ones either. What I'm saying is that it's clear that the makers of this show were, on the whole, more willing to portray gay sexuality as an element of horror or as comic relief than they were to portray it as a part of a normal relationship. Okay, speaking of comic relief, let's talk about joke characters. They are all male and all only appear in one episode. There are no recurring characters that fall in this category. And the characters I put in this category, um, I don't... I didn't put them there because they were funny characters who happened to be gay. I only put characters here whose sexuality is the butt of the joke. The Chief is our first example. Dean thinks he's meeting with an informant, but was tricked into going to a gay BDSM club and asking for a dominant. He throws up in his mouth when the Chief asks if he has a safe word, and they move on to the next scene. That's the only gay representation in season 4, by the way. <laughs> then we have Damien and Barnes. As I said in the intro, this show gets very meta. These guys are cosplayers and LARPers at a fan convention for the book series Supernatural. Damien and Barnes are participating in a fake ghost hunt organized by the con when they stumble upon a real ghost that the real Sam and Dean are hunting. While they're pretty bumbling and get in Dean and Sam's way, they do actually manage to get some work done and in the end actually save their lives. After the ghost is dealt with, Dean tries to tell them that he's the real Dean and they don't believe him but they do have a genuinely emotional conversation with him. It's overall a nice moment. Until this point, there's been no indication that these two guys are in a romantic relationship. Then Dean makes a comment about them being a good team, even though he's still an asshole to them when they say they met in a supernatural chat room. Well, it must be nice to get out of your parents' basement, make some friends. <laughs> Dude, what is your damage? Anyway, then they say, we're more than friends, we're partners, and hold hands while Damien rests his head on Barnes's shoulder. Then Dean acts like a huge weirdo. He doesn't say anything bigoted, but he's clearly uncomfortable. He kind of tries to be supportive, I guess. Well, <clears throat> howdy, partners. Howdy. Then he makes this face, and I do think this is a wow, why did I say that grimace more than anything else, but like, can you just be normal about gay people for five seconds, my dude? Also, two men being in a relationship being treated as a weird, funny revelation is homophobic. It's not overtly hateful, it's just, whoa, two guys dating. It's kind of weird, right? It's not weird. And it's really not hard to be normal about gay people. I do really wish it didn't have the incest angle with them cosplaying brothers, because I think that gives a kind of cop-out for Dean's discomfort towards them, where it's like, well, he's grossed out because they're pretending to be him and his brother, not because they're gay. And that's kind of a lame excuse, considering how he reacts to other gay people as well. And also, like, the show chose to have them cosplay brothers. They didn't have to do that. There are issues outside of the show with respect to shipping Sam and Dean together, but there's this problem where it seems like the writers and actors conflate incest shipping with all gay shipping, which really, really sucks. Like, they do this to the point that at a convention, a fan can ask about Castiel's canonical love confession. When did Dean know that Cass's love for him was a deep romantic love? And Jensen and Jared gave this abysmal response, where Jared brought up incest and pedophilia apropos of nothing. I won't go into too much detail about it, but Bob West has a great video that really gets into why this is so harmful on a lot of different levels, and I'd highly recommend it if you're interested. Anyway, I am trying to not bring up outside stuff, but I think that it's important context to have when looking at how the show presents and reacts to its gay characters. In our next example, two guys kiss in a vampire-themed bar. Dean and Sam's reaction looks really bad, but if we are to give them any benefit of the doubt, the reason they're so surprised is because they thought that these guys were vampires who were targeting women. So it's not just that they're shocked by gay people, although, like... <laughs> Bi people exist, you fucking weirdos. 
It's not quite as bad as it seems at first glance, but it's still pretty fucking bad. Again, two men being together is presented as some kind of shocking thing. Next, in a similar situation, Cass and Dean were trying to find a Cupid and waiting in a bar where they knew one of its targets was, but they couldn't figure out who the other target would be since the only people around are men. They originally think that this delivery person is the target, but it turns out that she's the Cupid, and she makes these two men fall in love. Dean gets a reaction shot, another Dean looks shocked at gay people moment, thanks for that. Cass doesn't react, which makes sense. He stated before that he is utterly indifferent to sexual orientation. And he said that while murdering a Westboro Baptist stand-in who was claiming that God hated gay people, so that's fun. And he who lies in my name shall choke on his own false tongue, and his poisonous words shall betray him. <laughs> Cass really is the overenthusiastic ally who later turns out to just be part of the community. I love that for him. Although, God. Okay, as I said, this video isn't about nonsense experiences outside of sexuality, but I have to mention that Cass actually has a stunningly transphobic line earlier in the Cupid scene. They're trying to figure out who this guy will be made to fall in love with by the Cupid, so Dean has Cass see if there are any women nearby, assuming that it will be a woman. Cass comes back and says this. There was one female, but... What? I don't think she was female. What the fuck are you talking about? Why would he say that? Why would he assume that that would mean that this man couldn't be interested in her? Why would he refer to her as a female in the first place if he was gonna say he didn't think she was? This is so fucking stupid. Why would an angel even care? Dean's homophobia, while I don't exactly enjoy it, at least makes sense from a character perspective. He's a regular human man with regular human prejudices. But Cass, on the other hand, is an angel, and has explicitly said that he doesn't care about sexual orientation. Gender identity and sexual orientation aren't the same thing, but there is absolutely no reason for an angel to care about either of them, or to remark on them really at all. I think that this is completely out of character for Cass, but it happened. Back to the episode itself. I was watching the show live when this episode aired, and I still remember the fan response. People were so sure that this meant something that these guys fell in love in front of Dean and Cass. And like, I can't really blame them. Along with other things happening on the show at the time around Cass and Dean's relationship, it really did feel like it was leading up to something, but it didn't. It was just another gay joke, because wow, who would expect that two men would be the ones to fall in love? That's it for comedic characters. I think this makes it pretty clear how the show treats gay men. Gay male sexuality is, in the instances where it's not demonized, played for laughs. However, I think I should note that the only examples of, I would say, violent homophobia in the show are done by villain characters. Cass killed that homophobic preacher two seasons before the Cupid guys, and while he was on a little bit of a power trip at the time... And who the heck are you? I'm God. Killing the preacher was not really presented as wrong. The problem is that the show engages with homophobia in an extremely shallow way. People who picket funerals are obviously bad and are condemned by the show. They are killed and it's presented as kind of a badass moment. But Sam and Dean are also obviously uncomfortable and awkward around gay people, and gay relationships are played for laughs. Violent homophobia is explicitly condemned, but that doesn't mean that more subtle forms of homophobia aren't present, and some of them aren't even that subtle. Condemning only the worst, most violent forms of homophobia isn't enough. Just because you're against literally the Westboro Baptist Church doesn't mean that you get a free pass to make fun of gay people. Before I get into tragic characters, I'd like to talk about the characters that I consider neutral or positive. A few of these have only a single line or other minor signifier of gayness, so I don't have much to say about them individually. I think it's good that they're there, but it's really the bare minimum to simply acknowledge that gay people exist in the world so I'm not going to praise the show for it. Also, these kinds of characters don't start showing up until the later part of season 7. First, we have Gilda, the fairy Charlie makes out with, who isn't really given any characterization. I'll talk about this a little more when I get to Charlie, but for now, I'll just say that while I think this character is, on the whole, neutral, I think the way the kiss is filmed comes across as somewhat voyeuristic. Then we have Aaron Bass, the guy who flirts with Dean. Dean reacts in a really flustered way, but never actually says that he's straight or not interested, just talks about how he's working right now. Federal investigation. 
Is that supposed to make you less interesting? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I, I, hope, I hope I didn't freak you out or anything. No, no, I'm not, not, not freaked out. It's just a, you know, a federal thing. Um, <clears throat> okay, citizen, as you were. You have a good night. You, you have a, okay. Anyway, later on in this episode, it turns that Aaron wasn't actually flirting, but that he was just making excuses for following Dean. Aaron, as far as I know, is not confirmed to be gay, since this was a distraction tactic and not genuine flirting, but I felt like I should include this scene since it's an example of how the show chose to present a guy flirting with another guy. In isolation, I have no problems with this scene. Dean is awkward about being flirted with, but not in a way that came across as homophobic, to me at least. But if you'll bear with me for a second, I'm going to give a little personal anecdote about my feelings about this scene. Indirectly, this is the scene that made me stop watching the show. When I first saw it, it sort of got my hopes up that they might actually do something with Dean's sexuality. Like, he never said that he's straight here, and he doesn't react like you'd expect a straight guy to react. I wasn't, like, that hopeful, but it did make me think there was at least a possibility, because I didn't understand why the scene was shot in this way if it wasn't meant to imply something about Dean. Then, while season 9 was airing, the director's commentary for the previous season came out, and I saw clips of it going around. He was so funny in this. Yeah. That whole like close up where he pulls yeah. the wallet back, that was something he did and that we caught with the with the camera. Yeah. It was so much fun to shoot that because he played it so right down the middle, you know, and just more awkward about it. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, wow, somebody likes me. And well, that's just, the weird thing, is that it reads in this weird way where it does feel like Dean's a little bit like it's almost like a romantic comedy oh, kind sure. of fluster, yeah. which is very interesting for the character Dean, like because it just sort of suggests this weird <laughs> this, <laughs> this potential <laughs> potential for, uh, for Aaron love and Dean. in all places. They could come together. Easy. God, that fucking pissed me off so bad. I finally realized that even the idea of Dean being bi was a joke to them, and they were never in a million years going to actually do it. So you might be saying, "What about that pissed you off?" They said he could be interpreted as bi. That's what you want, isn't it? But no, what they said was, this scene looks gay, Jensen did some stuff that made it look gay, and we cut and edited it to emphasize that, and isn't that super weird and funny? This is not how they would talk about it if it was actually on the table as a possibility. Him being bi wasn't even a make or break thing for me, it was just that they were so dismissive about even the idea that they purposefully edited a scene to make it look like he might be bi as a joke. And then they treated fans like they were insane perverts for picking up on it. This was the last straw for me after I had already been slowly losing interest. So I completely dropped the show, and I didn't engage with it again for six years. Okay, anecdote over. Moving on. He is technically a recurring character, as they call him for information in season 12, but there's not really much to say about that appearance, other than that he's at a very loud dance club, so at least he seems like he's having fun. Next is Siobhan and Kristen. So, in this episode, a high school is putting on a play inspired by the Supernatural novels. Dean and Sam happen to be investigating a case in the school and have to interview some of the kids to figure out what's going on. The kids playing Dean and Cass are in a relationship. Dean acts weird about it. What are they doing? Um, kids these days call it hugging. The director also mentions that there is subtext between Dean and Cass. And Dean looks into the camera and basically rolls his eyes. Don't look at me, motherfucker. You did this to yourself. I had such a hard time watching this episode. I just... It feels so uncomfortable. Not because I think these kids are bad characters, but like, the way it's presented, the way Dean and Sam react to it... Well, actually, just the way Dean reacts to it, Sam is pretty normal. He still makes jokes, but it's that he doesn't get why people don't think him and Cass should be together, which is funny. Dean is just really defensive in a way that doesn't make sense for a non-homophobic straight man to be. I don't understand. Me neither. I mean, shouldn't it be DSTL? Really? That's your issue with this? No, of course it's not my issue. You know, how about SASTL? Samstiel. Okay, all right. You know what? You're going to do that thing where you just shut the hell up forever. Cass Dean, shut your face. Get in the car. Why are you so pissed off, dude? Especially when juxtaposed with Sam's reaction. Because the way he reacts really does make it seem like he's just uncomfortable with people seeing him as possibly gay. 
it does turn out that he says the kid should interpret it whatever way she wants, which, like, thanks for your permission, jackass. This feels so condescending. Sorry, I know I'm getting angrier than I need to about this. It just really rubbed me the wrong way. I have no problem with the characters themselves. I like that we have a relationship between two girls that's mostly not made into a joke, and that neither of them die. But it's all so focused on Dean's reaction specifically. They're not really characters. They're just a way for the show to directly address people who ship Dean and Cass. A lot of people like this episode, and I think I understand why. I just feel like it's patronizing. Like, yeah, you can make them gay, you crazy kids. Like, no, you did that. You continue to do that. <laughs> Whatever, man, I hate this show sometimes. I know I'm technically putting these characters in the neutral positive category, but just because they don't fall anywhere else doesn't mean that they're really, like, good. <laughs> now we have Cesar and Jesse Cuevas. I actually like these guys a lot. They're hunting partners and a married couple who are hunting the thing that killed Jesse's older brother when he was a kid. They succeed in their mission in this episode, and it turns out they're planning to peacefully retire from hunting, something almost no one gets to do in this show. That's nice, and I'm glad we had these characters, but what's with the lack of affection? They barely touch each other, and none of it is what would normally be considered an overtly romantic gesture. They're supposed to be married. I don't think they even say I love you to each other. And while it's implied that this town is not particularly accepting, there are a lot of points where they're not in public and they don't take any steps to hide their relationship or seem like they're worried about anyone's reaction. They don't seem like they're avoiding affection out of fear, they just aren't written to be affectionate. They've been on this revenge mission together for a very long time. Jesse's been after this thing since childhood, and they finally wipe out the monsters that kill Jesse's brother and even find his brother's body and give him a funeral pyre. This seems like a place where if there was ever a time for a kiss, it would be somewhere in here, right? They just killed the monster they've been hunting for years. They're about to retire and have a peaceful life. They seem happy. They put an arm around each other's shoulders, but nothing romantic, really. If they hadn't explicitly said they were together, this is exactly the kind of relationship where you'd have people saying like, oh, why do you have to make everything be gay? Just let me be friends. <laughs> also, Dean is weird about it again when they say they're married. Oh, you guys fight just like brothers. <laughs> Almost as bad as us. Well, it's more like an old married couple. <laughs> oh. Okay. That's... Oh my god, I just want to spray him with water every time he does his little woo, gay people exist face journey. He does recover and ask what it's like to be married to a hunter, not to a man. So at least there's that, but come on. I do think these characters are, on the whole, positive. They get a happy ending, and they're introduced by saving Sam and Dean's lives. They're badass. But when compared to both the demonized characters and joke characters, there is a stark difference in what level of affection the show seems to find acceptable. It's fine for Crowley to kiss dudes to steal their souls. It's fine for a vampire to infect a woman with a kiss. It's fine for two unnamed dudes to kiss as an excuse for a shocked cutaway to Sam and Dean, but a married couple can't have a consensual romantic kiss? And it was 2016 when this episode aired, did they really need to have Dean act like he'd been in cryostasis for the last 10 years? Christ. Finally, we have Max and Stacy, who appear in two episodes. Stacy actually almost gets killed in her second appearance, but is immediately healed. I think they work well as what they are, a couple of dumb teenagers trying to impress each other. They steal the Impala from Sam and Dean, which is fun, and they get involved in a hunt without dying. They're cute. I like them. And that's it for neutral and positive characters. There is an obvious difference in the way straight couples and same-gender couples are treated on Supernatural. Even though I think these characters were more positive than negative, and I'm glad none of them died, there are still issues with how the show portrayed them. The few positive gay relationships on this show are almost entirely sexless and barely romantic. As I said in the section about demonization, this show has on-screen sex scenes and suggestive moments, a lot of them, but only between men and women. And if you want to talk about censorship and executive meddling, I don't know anything about that and have no way of finding out, but I'm not trying to assign blame. Regardless of the reason or who is ultimately responsible, the final product is a show that has obvious biases about what is considered acceptable to show in romantic relationships. To be clear, I'm not against asexual representation at all. I am asexual myself. But that isn't what this is. Having a gay relationship be very chaste isn't the same as having actual ace representation, 
And even if it was, if your only ace characters are gay and not straight, then that is indicative of a prejudice against gay sexuality specifically. Also, if your positive gay characters are asexual and the ones with the more negative portrayal aren't, that's also indicative of a prejudice against gay sexuality. It's, I'm fine with gay people, as long as they keep it in the bedroom. Other than a couple lines from Charlie, gay predators are the only ones that ever actually express overt sexual desires. As I said, I think Charlie and Gilda's kiss was filmed in a voyeuristic way. The shot of the vampire kissing a woman against her will is shot in a similar fashion. The only kiss between men that's shot in a similar way is Crowley kissing a man against his will, where the reason for the close-ups and lingering shots is to show how grossed out he is. Okay, I want you to imagine this show presenting a consensual kiss between men in the same way they did between Charlie and Gilda. Let's say between Cesar and Jesse. It just would not happen. And we have to ask, why is that? Well, I have the answer. It's because the kiss between Charlie and Gilda was filmed to be hot, and kisses between men were shot to shock, horrify, and amuse. Finally, let's look at tragic characters. In Wendy's case, the only way we know that she's probably a lesbian or bi is that she has a Love is Love t-shirt with Venus symbols on it, and it's never mentioned directly, so I don't have much to say about her. I will say that I'm including her in the tragedy category because she spent the entire episode being tortured, even though she does survive in the end. Okay, first, Lily Baker. Most people don't count the vampire kiss, which is fair as it is assault, so she is generally considered the actual first gay character in Supernatural. She, like Sam Winchester and the others present here, was infected with demon blood as a baby and gained powers later in life because of that. Sam gets psychic visions and telekinesis, Ava gets psychic visions as well, Jake gets super strength, and Andy gets mind control. Lily gets the power of stopping someone's heart if she touches them. We find out later that she accidentally killed her girlfriend with this power. Her having a girlfriend isn't made to be a joke or some kind of shocking twist. In fact, it isn't even commented on at all. That's almost impressive for coming out in 2007. On the other hand, why even bother? It's your first gay character, and we only know that because she mentions a dead partner. She leaves the group to go off by herself, is killed off screen, and has her body prominently displayed. All of these people end up dead this episode or the next one, so this isn't as egregious of a barrier gaze as it might seem at first glance, since pretty much everyone else gets buried too. But to sum up, the first character on Supernatural who mentions a same-gender romantic partner only does so to say that she killed them and then dies. Thank you for that. Next we have Corbett. Alan J. Corbett is an intern for a dorky amateur ghost hunting show, and he has a huge obvious crush on Ed, one of the main two guys. He isn't portrayed as predatory or creepy, and in my opinion, he comes across as very sweet. I like him. But he is portrayed as pathetic and definitely the butt of the joke for being attracted to Ed. He's not meant to be non-sympathetic or a purely comedic character, but the way they portray his crush is not good. And halfway through the episode, he is graphically killed by a ghost, and his love for Ed is used as a joke even after his death. He becomes a death echo, which is a type of ghost that simply reenacts their death rather than interacting or even being aware of their surroundings. This is how the team finds out he was killed. This isn't treated as a joke, they're disturbed and upset. And in the end, Ed leaves the safety of the salt circle in order to break Corbett out of it so he can be at peace and has an honestly pretty emotional speech to him. But unfortunately, that scene is preceded by the joke line, You gotta go be gay for that poor dead intern. And this whole thing where Harry's explaining to Ed that Corbett had a crush on him in the weirdest and most uncomfortable way possible. He had feelings for you. Huh? He wanted you. What? What did he be to what? You know. So that brings it down. Then, while the other ghost is about to kill everybody, Corbett goes and kills him, which is pretty cool. By now, you've probably noticed that this episode was filmed in a found footage style. After they leave the house, they have a tribute to Corbett in the video, and it's a joke. I've heard some people argue that the line, Gay love can pierce through the veil of death and save the day, is sincere, but no. Considering how Ed and Harry are portrayed, the comedic tone of this episode, and the time period it was written in, it's a joke. It's a homophobic joke, because the people who wrote it think the phrase gay love is funny. 
This episode has a lot of fun moments, and it's genuinely funny in parts. But Corbett's crush shouldn't have been used as a joke, especially not after he died. Yeah, I mean, it's it's bizarre how y'all are able to, uh, to honor Corbett's memory while grossly exploiting the manner of his death. Well done. Next we have Sue. She has a crush on her married female friend who, unbeknownst to her, is a violent witch married to another violent witch. Sue is portrayed as oblivious, annoying, and kind of pathetic, and it's obvious that her feelings are unrequited. The male witch kills Sue to spite his wife since they're having a marital dispute. The female witch is annoyed by this, but it's clear that she didn't really care about Sue. She and her husband make up by the end of the episode, and no one cares that Sue got decapitated. Next we have Charlie. She's definitely both a fan favorite and a personal favorite, but unfortunately her portrayal is not without its flaws. She definitely comes across to me as kind of a straight man's idea of what a lesbian is like. That's not to say that there are no lesbians out there who relate to Charlie and find her accurate to their experiences, and if that's you, that's great. But there are some aspects of her character, for example, watching the same porn that Dean does, having a tattoo of, quote, Slave Leia, and basically bragging to her male coworker about how she scored at a pro-choice conference and weirdly seeming to show him nudes she got, I think? I don't know what else this scene would signify. Pictures or it didn't happen, right? <sighs> You hooked up at a charity benefit? If you can't score to reproductive rights function, then you simply cannot score. All of that is stuff that really seems like what a straight man would come up with to show a woman's attraction to women. Despite all that stuff, I do still think that Charlie was a good addition to the show. She's very heroic in her first episode, and she's given a lot of solo screen time, which is unusual for new characters. I think she was a conscious choice to try to make up for the criticism of past homophobic portrayals, as well as criticisms of their lack of female characters in general. Charlie returns next season. She gets captured by the villain of the episode, and Sam and Dean spend some time searching for her. Charlie essentially seduces the fairy Gilda, and they make out until Dean and Sam turn up like, hey, we're here to save you. This is the first and only consensual kiss between people of the same gender on Supernatural that isn't treated like a gag. It's fine. I don't hate it. It's also between two conventionally attractive, young, gender-conforming women which I'm sure didn't hurt when trying to get it approved, and probably helped with getting homophobes on board who would have called this level of makeout between men gratuitous or disgusting. I do think it's overall a good episode. She has a couple more appearances, no more on-screen relationships with women though. She gets killed saving Dean and then immediately resurrected. In that same episode, we also meet Dorothy. Charlie decides to join her in Oz, which does remove her in the show, but not by killing her. This is about as good of a send-off as a character can get on a show this violent, which unfortunately is part of why the circumstances of her return get on my nerves so much. A season later, Charlie comes back from Oz. This is the part where she's split into good and bad parts for reasons. Dark Charlie, as they call her, is torturing people and fighting Sam and Dean. Good Charlie shows up and seems very similar to normal Charlie, except she has more qualms about lying. However, the biggest difference shows up when they go to a bar and Charlie makes this comment. And let me just tell you, being good is really annoying. Normally at a place like this, I'd be pounding Harvey Wallbangers and checking out the bartender's ass. Now, all I want to do is sip club soda and send her to college. And like, that's a weird choice. If you wanted to make good Charlie more wholesome than normal, she could have still been attracted to girls. Something like, I want to give her flowers and meet her parents, or... I want to leave a trail of rose petals to a bed kind of thing. Like, I'm far from a professional writer, but something along those lines would have been better, in my opinion. This is another instance where gay sexuality is explicitly demonized, associated with the bad parts of herself. Everyone agrees that they need to recombine both parts of her for her to be whole again, so at least they're not saying that this version of Charlie is better than her old self. Dean fights Dark Charlie, which causes Good Charlie to get hurt as well. Dean at this point has been cursed with the Mark of Cain, which will make him progressively more murderous and violent, so this isn't meant to be his normal behavior, but a sign that his condition is worsening. It's still really hard to watch. In the end, Dean is able to stop himself, and they combine the two Charlies to make her whole again. After she wakes up, Dean is appropriately contrite. Charlie forgives him, which is very generous of her. Then she and Sam start working together behind Dean's back, looking for a cure for the Mark of Cain. She is purposefully antagonized by the witch they're forcing to help them, and she goes to a motel to clear her head. 
away from distractions, she is able to crack the code that will allow them to break the curse on Dean. Predictably, she is almost immediately found by one of their enemies. He's looking for a book, which she doesn't have. He might have settled for her notes, which Dean and Sam beg her to give him, but she refuses since they contain the key to saving Dean. She manages to send a message in an attachment before this guy breaks into the bathroom she's hiding in, and she destroys her computer to prevent him from getting the cipher. We don't see her death, just her raising her knife, but her bloody corpse is graphically displayed when Dean and Sam come to find her. This image is repeated in a lot of previously on segments. The group this guy belonged to aren't even a big bad, and they get completely wiped out by Dean a few episodes later in Revenge. To me, this just makes Charlie's death e seem even more ignominious, as the threat is completely removed over the course of one episode, and she wasn't even able to hold off one guy after all her experiences fighting the supernatural. Sam is given the blame for this by Dean, since Sam asked Charlie for help in curing him when Dean wanted them to stop looking. Charlie's own agency is not taken into account. She made a poor choice here, one that I think she was too smart to make. Not that she didn't give up the information, I think that was a heroic and brave thing to do. The stupid thing was leaving a safe area and putting herself in danger, when she had supposedly been fighting a war in Oz for years at this point. Are you telling me she had never had to be in a room with a person she didn't get along with before? It's just very contrived, and poor writing in my opinion. Also a time where a gay character died for Dean's sake, keep track of that. Jenna shows up in the first episode of season 11 as a survivor of the most recent apocalyptic scenario that was directly caused by the Winchesters, the release of the darkness. If you're wondering what the darkness is, I don't want to explain it, and don't worry about it. One of the effects is zombies. <laughs> Jenna gets a lot of screen time this episode and is shown to be competent with firearms and to have a cool head under pressure. She knows the people in this town personally and she helps to humanize them as more than just mindless zombies. This man who is infected gives her his baby to look after and she is clearly not happy about it but agrees. Dean and Jenna leave with the baby while Sam stays behind to try to find a cure. They go to Jenna's grandma's house and she mentions some of her memories around the area using she pronouns to refer to the person she had her first kiss with. In the second episode of the season, she also gets a lot of screen time. At this point, I was thinking she might become a more, a more permanent recurring character, considering she knew about hunting now and clearly had a lot of skills that would lend well to it, as well as getting some character moments with the mentions of her romantic history and how her grandmother was extremely Catholic. Unfortunately, she has her soul eaten by the baby, Amara, who it turns out is actually the personification of the darkness. She brutally kills her grandma, starts knocking over porcelain figures of saints, and fights with Dean, who was trying to restrain her without killing her before she has her neck snapped by Crowley, who was around looking for Amara. Dean seems slightly annoyed by this. I know these guys see a lot of people die, but like, I don't get why he doesn't at least try to kill Crowley for that. He just pins him and leaves him alone for him to fucking escape because yeah, obviously he's going to escape. And also, even if he didn't just teleport or whatever, if he was genuinely pinned by the angel blade, he could just smoke out like demons do all the time if they're not in a devil's trap, which he isn't and Dean knows that. I was surprised by this death and something being unexpected can be a good thing sometimes, but in this case I think it was detrimental. Why spend so much time on Jenna and building up her history if they were just going to snap her neck and forget about her? She doesn't come back and Sam and Dean never even mention her again. Next we have Max Baines. He's a witch, as with his mother, and when Sam asks what she taught him, he makes a joke about how it was mostly how to seduce men. Sam laughs and doesn't get awkward about it, thank you Sam. I'm fine with this. I think it was a smart way to quickly establish that a character was attracted to men, and while it is a joke, it's a joke Max is making himself, not one at his expense. Also, no one acts like a freak about finding out a guy is gay. Probably because Dean isn't present to do so. There's another episode focused specifically on the Banes in which Alicia is killed, as well as Tasha, their mother. Max performs a faux resurrection that only creates a facsimile of Alicia, and the spell condemns his own soul to hell. So that sucks. This is both Max and Alicia's final appearances on the show, so their arc ends with her being made out of twigs, and him with his whole family dead and his soul condemned to eternal torture. They are never seen or even mentioned again, even in episodes where it would make sense for the brothers to seek out the help of a powerful witch. Okay, these last four I included in this category, despite them technically having neutral endings, because the resolution to their stories occurs off screen while the tragic parts of their stories occur on screen. Hopefully that makes sense. Alternate Universe Charlie and Stevie. 
there's an alternate universe version of Charlie who enters in season 12. It's not the same character. She doesn't have any history or relationship with Sam and Dean, and she doesn't have any of Charlie's personality traits regarding her being geeky or dorky. She has no on-screen relationships with women until season 15, when her and this character, Stevie, also from Apocalypse World, are living together and eating breakfast. They also mentioned going on a date later. It's a monster hunting date, but that works for their characters. It's a pretty cute domestic scene, but like, this feels so sterilized. As far as I can tell, they're never even in the same frame together. I know I complained earlier that I thought the kiss between Charlie and Gilda was voyeuristic, so you might be thinking, what am I complaining about now? I wanted it to be less fetishizing, and this is. But like, the answer to fetishizing women's relationships isn't to treat them like gal pals. There's a lot of space between treating them like a porn category and treating them like just good friends. Then, everyone on the planet is killed by God. All of these characters get an off-screen resurrection later in the episode. I don't know how to feel about this, honestly. I think it gets a little gray when we don't actually see the resolution to a character's story. So we see them die, we see the way others respond and mourn their death, and later we hear that they've been resurrected, but we don't see it. That prevents any real emotional resolution. It's a visual medium. Telling is not going to have the same impact as showing, and they don't even do a very good job at the telling. If we have enough time to show all these characters dying, I'd really like to take the time to see them come back. It doesn't have to be a long scene, just something. Stevie and Charlie rematerialize and have a kiss. A hug, even. It would take like two seconds. Okay, next we have Claire and Kaya. They have a few really cute scenes together, and it definitely read as romantic to me, but there was still the possibility of a platonic reading of their relationship. We do later get confirmation that Claire, at least, considered Kaya to be her first love. Unfortunately, Kaya is killed and left behind in an alternate universe called The Bad Place. On a somewhat positive note, Kaya does come back, but it's two full seasons later. It turns out that she was never actually killed, just stuck in The Bad Place, which doesn't make any fucking sense, but alright. It's pretty clear that this was a response to the backlash they got for killing Kaya in the first place, not something they had planned from the start. She vaguely mentions going to see Claire, but neither of them are shown on screen again. This is another situation where the actual resolution takes place off screen. Claire was in love with Kaya and was devastated by her death, and we don't get to see her reaction to Kaya coming back. We don't even hear about it. Kaya's whole resurrection feels incredibly perfunctory. Finally, we have Connor Todd. He's killed in the cold open, and it's assumed that a monster killed him, because this is a show about monsters, but it turns out that it was just a regular human girl. She carved the word liar into his chest, and while it isn't stated outright, it is heavily implied that she considers him a liar because he's gay, and she was under the false impression that they were dating. So the violent homophobe is the villain of the episode and ends up getting taken to jail, but she's actually portrayed in a weirdly sympathetic way, with her father saying that he should have been paying more attention to her. Like, if she was putting people into fucking saw traps, this was not caused by a lack of parental affection. Also, did we really need more violence towards gay people in Supernatural? Especially when there's not even anything supernatural involved. It's just a hateful human. That's way too real for this show to try to tackle, in my opinion. And the way it's handled is in very poor taste. I think it's overly graphic and unnecessarily lurid in its description of Connor's death and of his body. The way they describe the condition his body was found in is extremely disturbing. Along with having liar carved into him, he's also had all his fingers cut off and stuffed down his throat. That's not the most violent thing that's ever happened in this show, but the thing about that is it's usually very disconnected from anything a human could do to another human. Monsters rip people apart, people get exploded into blood mist by telekinesis, all this horrible stuff. But this is just the murder and disfigurement of a gay man by another human being who hates him specifically for being gay. Cass is the final character I would consider tragic, but I want to go a little more in-depth on him, so before I get into that, I'd like to give my observations about this category on the whole. I've seen some people think that anyone complaining about barrier gays, or gay characters being treated poorly, think gay characters have to get special treatment or it's homophobic. I can only speak for myself, but that's not what I think. In this case, there aren't very many gay characters and killing so many of them off when that's not usually the case for most straight characters does at least look very biased. Let's look at the tragic characters who only appear in one episode. 
Lily Baker isn't the only one of this group who dies, but she is the first. Corbett is the only one to die in his episode, and the rest of the ghost facers make it out. Sue dies, her killer and his wife live, and are even portrayed somewhat sympathetically. Connor Todd dies, his killer lives, and is also portrayed somewhat sympathetically. That doesn't really seem fair to me. Also, if you think the biggest issue with gay representation in media these days is it's too happy and positive, I don't know what to say to you. That's just not the case. I have even seen other gay people say things like they don't like positive representation because it's boring, the characters don't do anything interesting or have any flaws, don't matter to the plot, or are just there to keep people from complaining about a lack of LGBTQ plus characters. But what that's actually describing is tokenism, as in token gay, which is not actually positive representation. It's just a cynical and cheap way to avoid criticism. Throwing in minor nods to the simple existence of gayness and expecting accolades for it. As I said earlier, death in this show is common. But despite that, straight characters still get a multitude of outcomes compared to gay characters. There are major straight or undefined characters who survive, who end up happy, who exit the story without being made into a tragedy. How many recurring gay characters in any category get a neutral ending? There's Stacy and Max, and probably Claire and Kaya, although we don't see it or even hear about it after Kaya's retcon resurrection, and Aaron, I suppose, at least doesn't have an explicitly bad ending. How many die or have tragic endings? All of the rest of them. Then there are the ones who are technically alive after being resurrected off screen, and those are Alt, Charlie, Stevie, and Cass. But we don't see them. Their deaths are worth showing, their lives aren't. And in Cass's case, I wouldn't call his ending happy, even though he is alive. Okay, I think it's time to talk about Cass. First, let me try to give a quick explanation of what the circumstances of Castiel's love confession actually were. Dean and Cass are being hunted by death. The only thing that death fears is the empty, the place where immortal beings without human souls, like angels and demons and such, go when they die. But the empty can't come to Earth unless it's summoned. It so happens that the Empty was trying to take this character, who Cass considers his son, but Cass made a deal to save his life. The Empty would let them both go, for now, but since it held a pretty big grudge against Cass for other reasons, it would take Cass only when he allowed himself to feel truly happy, to make it as painful as possible. So if he can experience a moment of true happiness, it would summon the Empty, who would kill both Cass and Death, saving Dean. And Cass realizes that the thing that would make him happy is confessing his romantic love for Dean. And since there do still appear to be some people denying that this confession is romantic, I'm going to quickly show why it's really not up for debate. Because the one thing I want, it's something I know I can't have. What does he want that he doesn't already have? Dean has said several times that Cass is his best friend, and that he even considers him as close as a brother, which is pretty much as close as a platonic relationship can be. Sam, you and Bobby are the closest things I have to family. That you are like a brother to me. Best friend we've ever had. You're a brother, Cass. I want you to know that. Cass is my best friend. You're my best friend, but I just let you go. It's clear that Dean loves him and cares for him deeply. Cass already has that, but he wants something different. And the only thing that makes sense is that he wants a different kind of relationship with Dean. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but... He wanted you. Now, I'm gonna get on my little non-binary soapbox for a sec. Bear with me. Castiel's confession is usually enough for people to agree that yes, obviously Cass is in love with Dean. But some people will then say... Well, he's not really gay, though, because he's an angel possessing a man's body and not really a man, so he can't be gay. What I say to that is, one, gay love is angelic, so jot that down. Two, then he sure as hell ain't straight. And three, non-binary people who identify as gay exist in the real world. Those aren't mutually exclusive categories. But even beyond all that, personally, I just never saw him as non-binary. He's played by a cisgender man, has used he him pronouns for the whole show, including on the two occasions where he is shown possessing a female human vessel, he's exclusively called brother by other angels, and he's never given any indication that he wants to be seen or treated as anything other than a man. 
So despite the gender of angels being somewhat of a gray area in the show, he does, in my opinion, at least seem to be presenting as a man. But if you do see Cass as non-binary, that's fine, and there is some canonical support for that reading. But people who bring this up as an argument against people referring to him as gay don't have any in-depth thoughts about what it would mean for him to be non-binary. They're just using it as a get-out-of-gay-free card, and it really doesn't work like that. Okay, off my soapbox. One pretty big problem with confirming your character is not straight after 11 years is that all the gay jokes you made about them become just direct homophobia. It's one thing to make a joke about a straight character's masculinity. It's another to call your confirmed gay character broken, a Nancy, tell him he needs to find a wife and make babies, graphically perform literal lobotomies on him because of his affection for a man, and on and on. All the little jokes about him being in love with Dean, him being Dean's boy toy, jokingly referring to Dean as his boyfriend, they've become genuinely malicious homophobic comments directed towards a gay man with an unrequited crush that everyone around him is laughing at. Honestly, rewatching the show with the knowledge that he is canonically in love with Dean, it's painful. And here's the final punchline. He finally tells the guy, who barely even responds, much less reciprocates, and he's still so happy that he finally told him that it triggers a deal he made that would come due when he experienced a moment of true happiness, and he dies. This sucks. He doesn't come back on screen, but we do hear his voice one more time. I'm going to show you that clip now. Uh, the first time I saw it, I thought it must have been edited by a fan, but it wasn't. Cass? Dean, I'm here. I'm hurt. Can you let me in? What's up? So after his death, Cass's voice is used to trick Dean into opening the door to the bunker and letting Lucifer inside. And Lucifer makes a reference to a 20-year-old Bud Light commercial. Incredible stuff, guys. This feels almost purposefully cruel. To the fans, I mean. Castiel has been a fan favorite since his introduction in 2008. He just died, and there are two episodes before the show ends for good. You'd think they wouldn't make the last time his voice was heard a manipulation by the devil as a setup for a joke that is cringy at best, or at least I'd think that. But that's it. We don't see him or hear him again after this. He's barely even mentioned. Honestly, it's bizarre. When it comes to his confession, I'm glad that it happened, even with all the fridge horror it causes. It feels pretty vindicating to have the confirmation that he's not straight after all these years, even though it was still too little too late, in my opinion, and could have been done much better. But the way they wrapped up Castiel's story doesn't make any sense from a narrative standpoint, especially for such a prominent character. The brothers have always been the main focus of the show, and not everyone loves Cass as much as I do, obviously. But whether or not you call him a lead character, he is far more prominent than any other recurring character, appearing in 139 episodes. More than twice as many as the next most prominent character, Crowley. Cass has been a huge part of this show ever since his introduction. His friendship breakup arc with Dean in season 15 was given a ton of narrative attention. When they make up, it's a huge moment. But now they have this romantic love confession, a type of story beat that is screaming for a response, any response, and it gets nothing, not even a no. I don't understand why they chose to do this in the first place if they were going to ignore it. They could have made Cass's moment of happiness something that wasn't explicitly romantic, but they chose to have him make a romantic love confession and sacrifice his life for the man he loves. Even if this was just a minor character, that sort of thing can't just be brushed past. He died for Dean, and he was in love with Dean, and Dean has nothing to say about that? This could have been fucking, I don't know, Garth or something, and it still would have felt wrong to just ignore that kind of sacrifice. But this is Cass, Dean's best friend for nigh on a decade at this point. Choosing to end his story with a love confession that is not only unrequited, but unanswered, and resurrecting him off screen with a line that many people miss because it's literally two words, is honestly baffling. Also, Dean's reaction doesn't seem right either. Cass has died before, and Dean was devastated and desperate to get him back. But now, Cass sacrificed himself explicitly to save his life, and he's just chilling? 
The unfortunate implication here is that once Dean finds out Cass is gay, he stops caring about him. Sam brings up how chipper he seems in the last episode, and he's just like, well, Cass would want us to be happy. And like, yeah, I guess. But also, you've rezzed him before, and you have an in with God now, so why aren't you demanding that he be brought back like you have multiple times before? Like, okay. Cass died in season 13, and Dean was going full Brokeback Mountain over it. Like, on his knees, screaming at God, punching shit, being a real asshole. He was basically suicidal, and as soon as they get Cass back, he's fine. He's practically giddy. Now, he seems like he's genuinely okay with Cass's death. Who cares? Pie Festival. Um, then, when he's in heaven, oh yeah, uh, he dies in the last episode in a really dumb way, um, and then goes to heaven. <laughs> um, when he's in heaven and hears Cass is alive, he just sort of smirks, but doesn't say anything. So Jack did all that. Well, Cass helped. But when he sees that his car is there, he's full face grinning and immediately gets up to go for a drive. The only way this makes sense to me is if Dean is just a massive homophobe. Which, unfortunately, as I've mentioned before, there are other points in the show that support that. It sucks. A lot of examples I've used of the show's homophobia involve Dean specifically, so you may be wondering why I think they should have made him bisexual. Part of that is that I really do think there are many scenes that would make more sense or be improved with a bi reading, although I don't want to spend time on that here as it's not the point of the video. But part of it is I would just rather interpret some of his behavior as him dealing with internalized homophobia as a closeted man rather than just bog standard bigotry because it really sucks to see a character that I otherwise really like and enjoy act like this. The thing is, that's something I'm doing for myself. I interpret him differently because it makes the show more enjoyable for me. But the fact is, canonically, he is straight and he is homophobic. They've doubled down on it so many times. He's friends with Charlie, he loves her. But I can't be bigoted, I have X type of friends is a statement that has, by now, become a cliche of someone who definitely can still be bigoted. And when it comes to gay men, he is obviously uncomfortable around them. If you haven't seen the show, it probably doesn't make any sense why I like this character at all. Due to the nature of this video, I'm only showing some of his worst moments here, not any of the positive ones. But even though the positive exists, that doesn't make the negative go away. Now, before I wrap things up, I'm going to take part in a time-honored supernatural fandom pastime, Parallels. Do I think what I'm about to talk about was intentional? No. Do I think it's an interesting piece of trivia? Yeah, I do. So, the first character I mentioned on the list was this female vampire. She's the first time a same-gender kiss was shown in Supernatural, but she isn't actually the first time a gay person was mentioned. The first was Marshall Hall. I didn't include him on the list because he doesn't appear on screen. We learn his name and sexuality from a newspaper article found in the home of a witch who was using a reaper to kill those she believes to be sinners. By killing them, she gives her unwitting husband the ability to perform miracles, by using the life forces of these so-called sinners to heal people of injuries and diseases. Earlier in the episode, Dean is healed from a fatal heart injury he got on a hunt. Sam doesn't want to look too closely into it, being a both a faithful man who wants to believe in miracles, and a loving brother who is just happy Dean is alive. Dean, on the other hand, doesn't buy that this came without a cost, and wants to investigate. They break into the preacher's house and find these articles, as well as the witch's altar. Other people targeted by the Reaper include a pro-choice advocate and an atheist staging a one-man protest outside of the tent revival. But the one whose life force had been used to heal Dean was Marshall Hall, an openly gay school teacher. He had a heart attack at the exact moment that Dean was healed from a fatal heart condition. Castiel, a gay man, dies to save Dean's life. Marshall Hall, a gay man, is killed to save Dean's life. They're the first and last gay characters mentioned by name on the show, and neither of them appear on screen during those mentions. It's not something I think really needs to be deeply analyzed, as it's obviously not an intentional parallel, or one that has a significant narrative meaning, but I do think it could be considered indicative of a consistent attitude towards gay characters that has persisted during the show's entire 15-year run. Gay characters are uniquely disposable. I don't think the plotline surrounding Marshall Hall is inherently homophobic. I don't even think it's bad storytelling. I actually really enjoyed that episode. 
The problem is that when looked at in the context of the show as a whole, it's the beginning of a pattern. It's very funny to me that a lot of people will flatly deny that Supernatural had any homophobia in it at all. Like, it started airing in 2005, it would be far more remarkable if it didn't have any homophobic elements. There are plenty of shows that are more explicitly hostile towards LGBTQ plus people, but I think it's important not to ignore or dismiss those elements in Supernatural just because worse examples exist. While I wouldn't say it was harmful to me personally, I do think it could be and was harmful to younger LGBTQ plus people, in particular gay kids, to see their attraction depicted so monstrously in such a popular piece of media. Okay, now this is probably obvious, but just in case, I'm not saying you can't like Supernatural or that liking it makes you a bigot. I like Supernatural or I wouldn't have watched hundreds and hundreds of fucking hours of it and spent, at a conservative estimate, thousands of hours thinking about it over the years. You don't need to self-flagellate. That doesn't help anyone. But please don't try to defend homophobic writing. That certainly doesn't help anyone either. I want to acknowledge that at no point in the show do I think that the creators were intending to be homophobic. However, intent and actions aren't the same thing. Whatever their views are, the way they portrayed gay people indicates a clear bias against them. Well, I think a video this long is supposed to end on either a joke or something profound, but I can't think of anything. Um, I'm gonna go feed my cat. Bye. <laughs> if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I would really appreciate any comments so that I know I'm not just screaming into the void. I think this is also the part where I ask you to like the video. I would love the validation. I'm gonna take a big ol' swing here and say if you think the work that went into this video is worth a coffee, feel free to send me a couple bucks on a Kofi. Feel free to send me money, that feels kinda weird to say. <laughs> but yeah, only if you feel like it and it won't be a hardship to you. I think I'm supposed to ask you to subscribe as well, but honestly, I don't think I'm gonna make any more videos like this. I made this for fun, and while I did have some fun making it, it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> I'm working on some unrelated things right now that I might make videos about, like art projects, animation, and game dev, but it probably won't be this kind of content again. So unless that other stuff intrigues you for some reason, you and I will be as two ships passing in the night, never to meet again. Goodbye forever. <coughs> Meow! <coughs> Meow! <coughs> I'm recording. Can I pick you up? Can I pick you up? Come here. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> You're too heavy. Good boy. <laughs>